I am here today with an icon, an icon in the business space, and I truly believe the next thought leader. Candy Valentino has been named in countless accolades, being Forbes 40, under 40, being one of the top business women in Arizona, all over the place. She has been in business for over 24 years. She's built countless businesses. And now she finally has unpacked all of her wisdom and has put it in her new book, Six Wealth Habits. So let's go, Candy. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored to sit with you. For real, as I read about you, your bio, your history, I got so inspired, first of all, because you just started from basically nothing. Like you started, let me like just dive into that, like your upbringing, because I think when someone hears and reads about you and they go to your social media, they're like, oh my gosh, like, did she have parents that sat and taught her business? Did she go to some business Ivy League school? Like, did she have... Uh, hundreds of mentors? Like, how did all this happen? So get started with your story. So I love that question because people see us as one way, right? But they often fail to recognize what we've been through to get to this place. And so for me, I started out in a really small town. My parents were teenagers when they had me. I grew up in a really small white trailer um, on my grandparents' little patch of ground. And we started on government assistance when I was born because my mom was 16 and my dad was 19. Wow. And my dad's a mechanic, self-taught. My mom's a cleaned houses my whole life. Neither of them have a high school diploma. And so life was more about survival than it was intention. But interestingly enough, I learned so much through that time because of not having a lot being able to make sure that we do as much as we can with the little that we have. And so starting out in that really small town and really kind of figuring life out as we went, it kind of wasn't the, that big of a deal to start a business at 19. So that's kind of where I was. And, and um, you know, just through a lot of difficult childhood experiences to have it to come through, starting a business at 19 kind of seemed pretty easy compared to all the other stuff that I'd gone through. Oh my gosh. So growing up, like your dad being a mechanic, you know, did you, did you watch what he did? Did you like sit in there or were you like in sports? Like what did that all look like? Cause I just wonder how does your brain know to start something at 19? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, most kids after school, they have maybe childcare or a tutor, they learn a sport. We didn't have that you know, luxury. So I went to my dad's garage every day from the time I was five, the school bus would drop me off at his little auto shop. And I would walk into the parts store that was up above and I'd hop up on the counter and get like a, an after school snack. And then I'd walk down to his garage and do my homework in the office and work with customers and answer the phone and type on the typewriter. Cause I'm that old. I love it. Um, but you know, it was really just learning and seeing the struggles firsthand of how to run a business and, and what he had to go through, how to interact with people. And I just think that when you, when you see that, you see someone else struggle. And, you know, my dad missed out on a lot. There wasn't, a, he wasn't around a lot right. because he was self-employed. Right. He wasn't really a business owner. And there's a, a huge difference, which we can unpack if you'd like, but, you know, watching him really work hard being self-employed, gave me the desire to create something different yeah. in this space. So yeah. when I started out at 19, I had a much different intention. Yeah. Wow. So good. So what was your first business? In the late nineties, I started a wellness spa before they were a thing. You know, now they're so popular and we have med spas, but back then none of that existed. So the closest one was about an hour and a half away. And I'd visited one and I'm like, these are amazing. Like all the women were amazing. And I was like, we don't have something like this. There has to be a demand, but there's nothing in the area that mm -hmm. can provide this. So I came back and I really, back then, you know, there wasn't a lot of the, there wasn't online, like as we know it. So I went into a college and pitched the idea and got a small business loan to start Whoa. from the SBA. Yeah. So I hired, like, I think it was seven employees on opening day and I had a 45 day run rate to figure out how to make it work. So talk about leverage. 
Oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. So then what came from there? Oh, from there, I mean, it was obviously the first few years I was 19. I was trying to figure it out, trying to figure out, you know, my friends were going to college and like, you know, having fun on the weekends. And I'm trying to figure out how to run a 941 and how to do inventory and how to pay employees and how to lead employees and how to market. And so there were so many things. I didn't know anything. But what I did know was that if somebody else has done it, Mm. If there's proof that somebody else has done what it is that you want to do, yeah. that why can't you? Right. And so rather than asking like, oh my gosh, who am I to think that I can do this? I just flipped that question and said, if there's proof that someone else can do it, yeah. why can't I? Yeah. And so then I just kept asking the right questions and moving forward. And, and by the time I was 23, I'd accomplished every single goal that I set out to achieve. And most of my friends were just graduating college at that point. So a lot of mistakes, a lot of lessons learned, but it really just starts with the belief that you can do it. For sure. The belief and having a why, for sure but knowing what to actually do, like the vehicle to sink your teeth into the business to start. I love that you really sacrificed a lot to gain a lot yeah. because that's the belief I have. That's what I did when I was 23, when everybody else was drinking, you know, like they were living for the vacations. I'm like, no, I'm going to invest in myself. When you were investing in yourself, investing in your business, you know, did you learn through application, you think, or did you have to like call upon people, read books? Like, what did that look like? Well, I don't have a degree. I don't have any corporate background, right? Like I've never even really worked for anybody other than when I was 16. Yeah. So everything I've done has been through self-education. And back in the day, we didn't have online or people that we could follow for great information. We had right. infomercials, and books. <laughs> and so that was where it all came from. I mean, I watched Tony's infomercial when I was 15 years old for personal power cassette tapes. I love it. Literally changed everything. I, I, I had money from a babysitting business, but I didn't have a credit card at the time. And so I said to my dad, I said, Hey, I said, I want to buy these cassette tapes. I said, they're, they're $600 but I have the money. I just need to use your card. And, and God love him. My dad's a, a dear, great friend. And, and he just said, you know, all you're going to do is make that guy rich and you're going to stay right where you are. And I remember thinking, watch me. And so when we were at Sears, which I don't even think Sears is around yeah, anymore, yeah. Um, uh, we were at Sears the next day getting some tools for the garage. I swiped a discover card application. I do not recommend this to anybody to do. It was a different time. And I filled out the Discover card application, sent it in the mail. He saw it. I was 15. He's like, she's never going to get that card. Discover card sent me a card. So I used that credit card to buy the cassette tapes. Discover got all their money back. <laughs> Nothing fraudulent happened. Um, but I got those first set of tapes and listened to them one by one by one by one in my room and wrote my first set of goals when I was 15. And from there, it was just reading books. It was just immersing myself in self-education when my friends were paying for their education. Right. I was literally running a business and reading books in my office when I was 19, trying to figure out how to run a business and how to invest. And, and it was really just from there. It was, you know, sometimes we, we wait for external validation. Yeah, we do. We wait for the opinions yeah. of others. We yeah. think that some guru or thought leader or someone's going to give us the keys to crack the code. Right. There is no code. There's nothing to crack. Right. Like building wealth and being successful are just a bunch of ordinary and often boring things. It's like, what are you willing to tr like trade? Like, what are you willing to sacrifice? You know, really, all I did was I traded my short term gratification for long term gains. Mm -hmm. And so I always say to people, if they really want to know what the secret is, it's what are you willing to give up now? Yes so that you can do anything later. Yeah. You know, I had to say no to so many things. My my friends were going to parties, they were doing all the fun stuff and I had to say no to so many of those things. If I would have said yes in those moments, I wouldn't be able to say yes to oh yeah, sure, I'll hop on a plane and come over to LA right. for a day and fly back. Like those things enable me to do so much more now, mm -hmm. starting a nonprofit, being able to help people. So I think it's not so much this like secret to being successful or secret to being wealthy. Yeah. It's just, what are you willing to give yes. up so yeah. that you can do whatever you want later? So well said, the drive, like literally you got to have that drive. I mean, how, I mean, obviously reading or listening, all that stuff helps your subconscious, your money mindset. But people always ask me, they're like, 
can you help me with my financial blueprint? You know, I always think of the law of the lid. I mean, you came from very humble beginnings. How did you keep increasing your lid? I mean, I'm sitting with a multi, multi millionaire right now. Obviously, you've had to continue to grow your mindset. Like, did you have lids? Did you have moments? Oh. For sure. Because when, you know, I remember the first time I crossed six figures, like I didn't know anybody else that was netting, taking home. Cause obviously there's a huge difference between a six, seven, eight figure business right. and a six, seven, eight figure net worth. A lot yeah. of people don't distinguish that when you hear on social media, huge difference. So huge. when I was doing six figures net, I was like, I don't know anyone else that's making this. So you kind of feel like you've made it. And totally. really there's a whole other level. Uh-huh. So, and, and actually that's okay. Like someone may, that might be their number one goal and all that they need, because actually the data that we did for the book, your life increases very small, like your true overall happiness when all of your needs are met. Mm-hmm. And that's right around $75,000 a year. Mm-hmm. So most people that are trying to stretch, if they don't have specific needs that they want to give or contribute, oftentimes that's an ego or significance play that they're yeah. trying to get more money. Yes. And I always say, if, if you're trying to just make a bunch of money and buy a bunch of things and have this you know, life that looks rich from the outside, you've completely missed the point. Totally. Like I always say, if that's what you want to do, like, you know, buy the jet, buy the cars and just stack a bunch of cash. Like don't even, don't buy my book. Yeah. Because you've literally missed the whole point of creating a really wealthy, rich life. And I think that's what's really important for people to understand the difference, that it's, Mm -hmm. it's not about all of these things that society has placed on us, that what we're supposed to do makes us successful. It's really it's having the choice to be able to invest in other people, to Mm. grow ourselves, to Mm. contribute to causes and people that are important to us. Like that's what it's all about. So back to answer your question, like I was always looking at someone else of what they had, but not what they had, what they did with what they had. Wow. Right. Yeah. It was like, what do they do with that money? And then it's really surrounding yourself with people that are doing bigger things so Mm -hmm. that you feel like the small guy at the table again. 100%. I always say like, I have people that I'm reaching down to pull up, but then I have people that are up here and I'm reaching on to them. Like it's this whole thing because I've hit lids in my career where I'm like, I I make more money in a week than I used to in a year. And I think I've made it. And, you know, uh, I'm around people that aren't intelligent about investing or, you know, taxes and things of that nature. And then boom, lid, you hit that lid, you know, and that happens so easily. And so you have to have that continuous improvement. I feel like I admire this so much about you. I feel like you've just continually bettered yourself. So you go from this med spa. And then when did you get into real estate? What other businesses have you been in? Because this is so inspiring. So I started investing in real estate like two years into business because I started to like have some profit and I went to buy my dream car, which at the time was a Jeep. I (laughs) I was like, you know, like who doesn't want a little Jeep? So I was like, I'm going to go buy this car. And I shopped around, I got some prices. And at the same time, I just happened to pass this house that had a big like, yellow sticker on the window. I was like, what is that yellow sticker? It was on the street of where my original location was. And I went in and again, just asking questions. I had a real estate agent that was a client at the time, Marion. I was like, Marion, what's this thing? It says like foreclosure. I mean, I'm 20 years old at the time. And she's like, oh, this is what that means. And here's what you have to do. And and I was so intrigued. And I had just read a book that talked about investing into real estate. And so rather than going and buying the Jeep, I did a cost analysis and figured out how much the Jeep would be worth, how much the house would be worth, and I bought the foreclosure. Now, just in contrast, a 2000 Jeep isn't even going to be worth $4,000 today, even though it was maybe $36,000 back then. Right. That $23,000 foreclosure after it was renovated and then rent has cash flowed over a quarter of a million dollars in that same amount of time wow. and has appreciated 5 to 10x. So it's what you do with your money. Right. People think that you need, there were so many years in my life, I wasn't making like significant amounts of money mm-hmm. net, but it was what I was doing with it. 
Wow. I was living on half of what I made. I was investing in real estate. I was maximizing my, my self-employed 401k and all the things that you can do to reduce your taxes. I was making sure that all of those things were taken care of because my number one goal was to never need anyone for money. Mm. Don't ever want to depend on anyone. Right. Don't ever to need yeah. anyone. Because I always say a lot of women get into relationships and they're so focused on that relationship but what can cost you more money than you can ever measure mm-hmm. is being with the wrong person. That's right. And that's male or male or female. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Being with the wrong person doesn't just cost you. People think when I say that, that I mean like the divorce and what yeah. the payout. It's the opportunities that are lost. That's right. It's the focus that you don't have. Yeah. And that can cost you so much mm. money. So I always say before you go take someone's last name, build your own. Yeah. And make sure that you have that financial independence yes. so that you don't have to need someone necessarily oh, for money. I, can, I think that's really important. I do too. And you just have such a better relationship. And, you know, I've been in, you know, coffee table conversations with acquaintances where it's like, oh, they, this guy, he's wealthy, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, uh, that's no, A, I don't need it. I have my own wealth. I always say smart women build wealth. I would rather fall in love with a guy for his values and for our connection than what you need from someone. And I feel like so many people go down that road of like, well, they could give me this. And it's like, you're not going to be happy. But you can give yourself that. You can. And the pride that you get in the the journey that you build yourself as a human Mm -hmm. from being able to do it on your own is just a much more rich life yeah. than being with someone because of the life that they can give you. Yeah. Like the, the you were saying about lids, like more often than the lids, I see people just putting a ceiling on themselves. Yeah. Like they just think that this is what life should look like. And, and maybe life's okay. Like maybe I always say that it's, it's easier to come from that place when you have leverage and you don't have a lot mm-hmm. than it is to consciously continue to up-level your life because it starts to get comfortable. Yeah. It starts to feel a little safe. So you have to make your life, if you want to keep stretching, you have to be around other people, but also remember that that glass ceiling or that lid may very well not have anything to do with your environment. It may be you Mm. putting that on yourself Yeah, because you're either too scared to try, you're too comfortable, or oftentimes what I experience is if maybe you don't care enough about your dreams and you value the opinions of others more. Right. Because that will really limit your growth too. Absolutely. So well said. Now, when you started making money and you knew, like, I love the intelligence of you because you knew, like, let's invest some of it. Let's do this. I think a lot of people, and even in my um, world where, you know, in certain spaces where they're trying to hit ranks and businesses, they make X amount of dollars. Now they want to like get the lifestyle with it. So it's like all the handbags and I love all this nice stuff. Right. But like the, the new car and the house and I mean, big leagues, we're talking jets. Right. But like the belts, the, the everything, right. You know, it's such a status thing. And so to have the discipline and the intelligence to say like, no, I want to invest because that's actually going to compound so much faster, so much more. Do you talk about this in the book at all? How did you even know to do that? Because like coming from, you know, both of us coming from humble beginnings, like when I like got my first big paycheck, it was like, you know, oh my gosh, like I I didn't know what to do with it. I'm like, do I, do I go buy that new car so I can like show that I'm successful? You you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, oftentimes we're trying to do those things to fill a need. We're trying to get the dopamine hit, the instant (sighs) gratification, the happiness in the moment. But I can tell you that it's fleeting. There is nothing that you can do that you will buy that will create a fulfilling life. And that's really what people are trying to do. They're trying to find fulfillment. They're actually trading it for a cheap hit of happiness. And so for me, I remember going in, I wanted the Bentley. I was like, okay, I want a Bentley. I want a Bentley. And then I literally walked into the dealership to stroke a check for a Bentley. And it was like this voice inside me said, you're missing the point. And I have just listened to those instincts as opposed to the the outside opinions of others. 
And I chose not to buy the Bentley. And I went instead and got a farm for the nonprofit. And we started an animal sanctuary and we've developed programs for at-risk youth, kids that are in the foster system, kids that have been sexually and physically abused to wow. provide hope and healing and show them what's possible. So what I always say to someone is if you are building some money, people think that just because they have some coming in, that, that, that they're all of a sudden that they have money, that they're wealthy. But it's not what you make. Right. It's what you keep. And it's what you do with it. Yeah. Because if you're trying to buy all the flashy things, I promise you at some point, you can't keep up with your lifestyle yeah. if you're not investing. You can't keep up with inflation if you're not investing. The one way to know if you're overspending is if you can't take, this is the litmus test. Okay. If I say to you, Emily, the only way you're ever going to be wealthy is to take 20% of your earned income right now okay. and immediately start putting it into passive or portfolio investments. And you're like, I can't do that 20%. That's too much because I have this, I have this. That's your indication that you are overspending, Got that it. you've leveraged what you've had and you're spending so much. Okay. If you can't stroke a check for a depreciating asset, the car, the boat, the bag, the whatever, and you're not already investing 20%, you shouldn't be buying it. Wow. And that's a really hard pill for someone to swallow because they want the bougie lifestyle. They want to look it. But I yeah. promise you, if you do the hard things for a little while, you'll be able to do whatever you want and more of it later. So, so rather than buying your first Louis bag, buy your first Louis stock. And Ooh. then when all of your friends are carrying Louie, you can see, oh yeah, I really love that bag. You should get that. Because now as the stock goes up, you make more money. <laughs> and then, so rather than paying earned income on depreciating assets, you want yeah. to take your earned income and invest it. And then the dividends from those investments, then you spend. It's a completely flip of what we're taught. It's totally a flip. We, we get this money, we think we spend it. I want you to just automatically just shift everything that you're thinking now. Anybody that's listening, I want you to take anything you're earning and think about how you're going to invest that. Mm. Is it going to be in real estate? Is it going to be in portfolio? Is it going to be stocks and dividends? Is it treasuries, mortgage-backed securities? These are all things, if you're like, I have no idea what she just said, yeah. this is a great Google search as opposed to consuming social media. Right. These are the things that you feed your mind. That mm. What we put in our brain, we're either consuming or we're creating. That's right. Do more creating. Do yes. more things that are going to expand your health and your wealth and not just take your time away and start to go all in on building a life that you love. Like oh. that's really where it's at. Yes. Oh, can I get an amen <laughs> right now? I'm like bouncing. I'm so excited <laughs> about this. And I try to teach the basics to this to women, especially because I love fashion. You love fashion. We are like, women that love fashion, right? Um, but little do people know, like if you glance on social media, it's like, I got that from a consignment shop. Yeah, I have never paid full price. Like my partner in life, like I taught him that as well. I'm like, we don't do that. I don't do that. Don't I go, my G-Wagon I've had for years and I bought it used. And if I wanted it a little different, I wrapped it. Yep. <laughs> It is you know? amazing that when you think you want a new car, detail it and wrap it and you feel like you right. want a new car. I have never bought a new vehicle. When I was 23 is the only time and it was the stupidest thing, but I went against my own beliefs because I was like, had hit this new level and I'm like, I'm buying this car. There, they weren't, there weren't any new ones because it was a new model. Mm. Stupidest financial decision I ever made. And I would never do it, never did it before, never did it since. The only time I buy my vehicles three to four years old, mm -hmm. when it's a sweet spot, when there's a little bit of warranty left or I can extend it. Yeah. I always make it feel a little special by wrapping it or yeah. wheels or whatever. Yeah. My Rolex, a lot of my stuff, they're pre-owned because I'll rather take somebody else, take that depreciation that doesn't know or came from money or right. doesn't know how to management. Right. And I'll take a half price discount. Yes. No problem. Yes. Like when I was talking to someone who has a jet, same thing. He's like, I didn't buy that jet new. He bought it like five years old and right. was able to pay half for it. So it's like being smart with your money, I think is just being a good steward of too. what is given to us. I do too. And if I can spend half or less on, that means I can give that much more mm. to a cause or a charity that really needs our help. Yeah. So that's where it is for me. It's, it's, yes, I love all those things, but if it means that I can't contribute or do something, it's just like I walked out of the Bentley dealer. I've done it twice now. I haven't bought the car because 
at the end of the day, I love my Range Rover. It's mm-hmm. five years old and it's great and it looks really cool. Yeah. It looks just like the ones that are 2020s. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, it's I think it's when you have your priorities in place and you realize what life is really about, those decisions mm-hmm. become a lot easier to make. Mm-hmm. So well said. How how did you understand that? Like how did you get the contribution? There's a whole chapter yeah. isn't in the, in the book yeah. about contribution, which it, it's kind of like might be a little backwards twisted to some people thinking, well, this is like a wealth book. Why is she talking about contribution? Uh, Can you expand on that? Well, it's interesting. There's two things. One, nobody ever made themselves broke by giving. People are broke because of their habits and their habits typically are all about them and not what they're actually contributing to others. So it's a huge part of the book. It's a whole chapter. It's a whole, it's a whole habit. There's only six habits and it's one of them. So it's a really important part. The other thing to remember is that you either have money or you have time. People can either donate their time if they don't have a lot of money and develop that habit, or they can donate money if they don't have a lot of time. And if anyone listening says, I don't have either, you don't have priorities. Yes. So you either have money, time, or if you have neither, you haven't balanced your priorities in life. So it's a really important thing. It's It's a way to develop that habit, to develop that muscle because when you what you do with a little money is exactly what you're going to do when you have a lot. Yes. And if you are teaching your kids, teaching just by your example of what you're doing and you're showing up for others, I promise you that'll pay tenfold back. I never started the nonprofit for any other reason other than I wanted to give back. Mm-hmm. I had bought a building. I was investing in real estate. I was really into commercial. And I came up to the, the building that I had just bought. I was 25. I had all the things, right? The shoes, the cars, all the things from the outside. And I pulled up to that building and I was like, what am I going to do with that building? Like, it's been sitting here for a year. I have no clue what to do. And I know that you're a person of faith, so I can share this with you. And I felt like it was the first time I heard God literally speak, like we're talking and said, put your animal shelter there. And I was like, I don't want an animal. Like, where did that even come from? Wow. Like, I'm literally yeah. buying four more properties to expand into four locations. I was working with a franchising attorney to franchise it and to be able to put it across the United States. I was manufacturing products in China. I had a whole line. Like, I was like, I'm not doing a nonprofit. Right. But yet it was like the recognition of everything I had and everything I didn't mm. all in one moment. And so from that moment on, I just know that when you hear those instincts, don't try to rationalize them. Don't try to understand them. Just do it. Yep. And so I just moved forward and started a nonprofit when I was 26. We've saved thousands of animals' lives. I donated that building to charity. And I only share that to say that the one maybe business mistake from the outside that I made by not doing all of those ex- the expansion, by not doing the franchising, by mm-hmm. not doing the nationwide rollout as we had intended, it actually gave me meaning yeah. to why I was getting up in the morning, yes. to why I was working late nights. Because I promise anyone that as you're trying to ascend to wealth, you think a lot of things matter, but when you already have it and you're able to look back, you're able to see like those first quarter goals were really insignificant Mm -hmm. when you gave hope to a child that had never heard that they get to choose what they want their life to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, the car that you're driving that you bought brand new or the shoes that you're wearing are really insignificant when you look at an animal that's been horribly abused and you know that now has love and life because of an organization you started. So it gives you such perspective in life. And I think that that's what a lot of people are missing when they talk about money. And that's why it's a a whole chapter in the book. So much wisdom. You have so much wisdom. Because people spend their whole life chasing, yeah. chasing. When I get that, when I'll be able to, it's going to somehow fulfill me. And it, it completely doesn't. doesn't. It may be like for five minutes. And I, it, it gets shorter as it goes. It does. I completely agree. I had that moment when I was around 26. And that's when I went to Africa. Because I was like, I, I actually bought the Bentley like a moron. Yeah. It's okay. and, <laughs> listen, it's a nice car. It was like a boat, yeah. but I was like, they're beautiful. <laughs> out, the motivation part, like after, I think there's different levels, right? So you get, and it's like new lifestyle, 
I can go like get cocktails. I can go to this nice restaurant. I can buy this handbag, this whatever money isn't an issue at all. I can just do my life. And it's like, oh, this is so much freedom. And then you're like, if there's not something bigger, if there's not something that's more meaningful, it's so freaking empty. It's so empty. And if you don't have the wisdom of how to steward it, I think God kind of puts a block on it too. Like, mm-hmm. and you have been so obedient. I call it the God whispers. It's like when you follow that obedience and you're, and I'm sure you're at this time in your life where it's like, I've got this going on and that going on. I don't have time to start a nonprofit. Like if you actually thought like, you know, you could have every excuse in the book, but you followed that. Yeah. It's blind faith, right? Blind like, faith. Blind faith was the, the same reason I started a, a business at 19. Like, when I had no business being it, I mean, I remember when people would walk in, they'd say, oh, where's the owner? And I'm like, hi. You know? <laughs> I can it's imagine like, you so, you know, cute. or walking out of my office. And it's like, you know, even back then I wore black suits because I like tried to look older. If totally. I could, so I could be taken seriously. But I think that it's, it's the interesting thing that when, you know, we have those little, as you call them, whispers. And I feel like there's one half of one second that we get what we're supposed to do before and then our brain drops in all of these things you're so right you know like oh well you can't do that yeah what are people gonna say what are people gonna think who do you think you are there's no business you like there's all this stuff that drops in and i always say just go back just go back just go back to the one half of one second of what you felt Mm. and what you heard Mm. and pause Mm, yeah and just go that way yeah because all of that other stuff is our brain trying to justify trying to protect us trying to fit and blend in because really we all have these ancient old conditionings and programs right so it's like what do we need to do to break free from that and what do we already know that we need but we're just too afraid to start Mm. and i think anyone that's listening to that got a gut check and then they went, yeah, but mm-hmm. what was before the yeah, but Ooh. that, that thing that comes before the yeah, but that's your next thing. That's your next goal. And rather than saying, oh my gosh, I don't think I can do this. Look, I've done this. I, I don't manage money. Well, look, I'm in debt. I'm that anything that's happened to you before this moment, you can't change, right? You can't control. Yeah. There's nothing that you can do. You get to control what's next. So all of these past mistakes that maybe made you broke or not in the right relationship or not in the right business, you can't change those. So you have to drop it and realize that you get a choice whether you're going to carry those same beliefs into this next chapter or you're going to choose again. And when you get to choose again, that's when your, your power comes in. And it's like the pause, pause for a moment, write down all the crap that you've been through, all the adversity that you've faced. Like, pause this and take five minutes and just write it all out. Like I know so many people that come up to me and they said, I've heard your story. And it's the first time I've ever talked about being abused as a child or the trauma that I've gone through. People are carrying around such big things that they're ignoring absolutely, and not addressing. And they think that building wealth or starting a business is difficult. Meanwhile, You've, you've got through 100% of your worst days. Yes. Like you've accomplished 100% of everything that you thought was going to break you. But instead, it's here to make you. That's so good. So it's like, write that, write that down. Mm-hmm. And when you start to doubt yourself, go back to that list. Remember who you are. Remember what you've gone through. And realize that this next thing is cake compared to the things that you've oh. done. And I think that's what people need to realize is what they're truly capable of and worthy of having if they just decide and move forward. Oh, girl. Oh, my gosh. Yes. I'm like, (laughs) can we just like, I'm going to jump on the couch, like for real, (laughs) because we've, you're, oh, even like for me personally, you just hit such a, oh, like you just hit my soul. Because it's like so many times, especially as achievers, you focus on gosh, I, I should have done this. I royally screwed up on that. I should have invested more here. But what you're saying, what I'm getting is like the power of the pause. Yes. Like realize what you've gone through, use that as a testimony. And then let's honestly, like for me, what I feel compelled with you is like, I want to learn your methods. I want to learn your principles. I want to learn from a woman like you who has invested, who's not only yourself, but you've teached thousands of others to invest within your programs now, within your book. But now you can make, 
you can make a new, you can, you can make a new way. And I know, I know that I know that I know that someone's walking right now. Walk, they're probably, you know, walking their kid or their dog and they're thinking, oh my gosh, like I want to make a new, I want to make a new way. Obviously get the book and learn the six principles, but what would be that next step? Like after they kind of brain dump of like, okay, like, do they budget candy? Like, what does this even look like? So if it's truly wealth, it's remembering that a lot of times people start to talk about money and it trips up these emotions. It does. Anxiety, shame, guilt, regret, all of these thoughts. You have to remember that what got you to this place is not going to get you to that next one. That's right. So you have to drop it. And the only way to drop it is to build the muscle. I always, with new entrepreneurs, they want to avoid their numbers. The number one way that you grow your personal finances or your business is it's all roads lead through data and numbers. Like, sorry to break it to you, but that's the way it goes. Wow. And so the only way that you can do that is to start to learn it. It's like, and people think like, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Like most people listening to this at one point went into a hospital, delivered a baby and a nurse hands them a baby and it's like, great job, mom. And now you're supposed to go on your own and figure out how to raise right. a life. And you think that you can't balance a budget or learn how to manage money. Like, so I think it's important for people to, to check that fear and those emotions mm. and those excuses, because that's all they are. And realize that you can learn to do this and you will. Mm. Number one, you can't build wealth with debt. So if you have any bad debt on depreciating assets, which means anything that you buy that immediately depreciates when you buy it, okay. a brand new car, a boat, the purse, anything that's on a credit card. And another way to factor it, I get really specific in the book because it's very playbook. It's awesome. not just theories. Oh, I love it. It's the rule of seven. Typically, anything, typically, generally speaking, anything over 7% interest is on bad debt. Most home loans, most business loans are less than that. And those are on assets. Okay. We got to get rid of debt first before you start trying to save and invest because you can never out invest bad debt. Okay. Meaning that you can't get on when we did the industry average of 40 years, the S&P 500 on average had about 9.3% average return. Meaning if you put your money in this market and you set it and forget it for 30 to 40 years, you're going to get roughly a 9% return. Okay. Some years were a lot more, some years were a lot less. But imagine if you're paying out 15, 20, 24% or some of these credit card loans, you're paying that out. You can't go put your money and hope to collect 9%. Like the math doesn't work. Right. We got to get rid of debt. And debt is not only the number one destroyer of wealth, but it's actually what keeps people up at night. There's a thing called debt stress syndrome. For sure. It's a real thing that people have anxiety over. So the first thing you got to tackle is that. These are not the sexy, fun things, but they're the real things. Mm -hmm. I always say, you may not like what I say, but I'm going to tell you the truth anyways because yeah. I care. Yeah. It's We got to get rid of that. And the way to do that, everyone has a different approach. I personally don't talk down to people. I think that people want wealth. They just need the tools yeah. to build the discipline. So I like to say, start with your highest percentage of credit card because that's the greatest destroyer. I don't need to teach you to like roll the debt. I just want to teach you how to actually get to the worst one first. Okay. So if you have 24, 19, 12, you're going to put them all on the list. I have a chart in the book and you're going to start to stack and get rid of all of the bad debt so that you can pay that down and start investing. So when we really break down what's the first step, that's the first step. Okay. Because most Americans don't even have over $1,000 saved in their savings account. So it's not just about investing. It's about protecting what you have too. Mm -hmm. So that's a really important step. But the first is we got to get rid of debt. Get rid of debt. Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh. Do you recommend people getting a side hustle? You know, side hustles are interesting. I think that depending on where you are in your life, mm. that I think, I, don't, I like context. I think people that just blanketly start a side hustle or don't, you got to give context to the person talking. Yeah. I always say that you don't necessarily need one, but you got to figure it out for you. There's only two ways to grow a business. There's only two ways to grow your bank account. You either increase your income and sales or you decrease your spending and expenses. That's it. All That's roads it. lead back to that. So every single every single modality that we're leveraging in business, we're either increasing revenue or decreasing expenses. When you really break down personal finance, we're either increasing what you're making or decreasing what you're spending. That's it. So most people need to increase what they're making 
So in that regard, then yes, maybe you do need to do something on the side. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're only working a full time, and I say only working because yes, I meant to say that you're only working a full time job. Right. You have probably another 20 to 40 hours in the week that you can be doing additional things. Mm -hmm. So what could you do? Is there a way that you could leverage what you're already doing in your daytime job, but doing it on Fiverr or on Upwork or, you know, cleaning houses on the side, doing DoorDash on this. Like there's so many ways that you can expand and earn more money. Right. And when you're driving your car to DoorDash or cleaning houses or doing these things, you can also be at the same time listening to podcasts, so listening true. to things that increase yes. your knowledge. Yep. And now you're getting a twofer. You're yep. getting paid to increase your knowledge and work. Love it. Right? Yeah. And then what you do is you take that money because you've already learned how to live on what you made. You take that money and now you can actually start paying down debt faster mm-hmm. so that you can start investing sooner. So that's why earning something on the side is typically a a key for people Mm -hmm. until they can do what obviously is my favorite thing, which is starting a business Yeah, and an actual business, not creating a job for yourself. Most people think they're entrepreneurs, but really all they did was they built themselves a job. You're so right. Because if you don't build a business, a machine that generates revenue, generates income, you're actually going to have a job for the rest of your life. And most people aren't intentional about that. So they- they build a cage for themselves. They yeah. have to show up, right. work with the client. They have to work with their team. They have to be on the webinar. They have to do You're things. so right. right? Yes. Right? And it's like, they don't realize it until it's like, oh, wait a minute. I actually just built a cage. But the entire time, not only did they build the cage, but they're holding the key. Mm. But then what happens is we get successful and now we have golden handcuffs. Now we can't quit what we're doing. Now we don't know how to expand and grow because now we have all these responsibilities. So I always say you don't need to burn the boats. A lot of people want to use that, but burning the boats for someone may actually be reckless. Right. If you have a family. To totally. For. So I always yeah. say you don't have to do it with such intensity. You can still have the same result. Maybe you need to do something on the side so that you can earn more revenue. Maybe you're already doing that and it's time to start building a business. Or maybe you just had an aha moment and you're like, oh crap, I'm actually self-employed. I actually build a job for myself, which is what most entrepreneurs find out when they work, start working with me. Yeah, <laughs> right? I bet, I bet. But it's because most people don't do this part first. And it's, we need to be intentional about what we're building. And I think there's a movement that happened on social media that glorified entrepreneurship and glamorized starting before you're ready. You're so- and I 100% believe that yeah. you don't need to have all the answers to start, but you got to have a plan of what you're building. Otherwise, what you're going to do is start kind of building a house and you're going to try to paint the walls before you actually have the foundation for it. You're going to start hanging drapes, but you don't actually have the studs framed right, right? Obviously, construction back. Yeah. So those are are my analogies. I love it. That is so key because that's when you start end up. People will, again, get five, 10 years down the road and go, oh my gosh, I hate this. Totally. And it's all because you didn't build it with the right intentionality in the beginning. So the question to ask anyone that has a business, are you truly an entrepreneur? Are you a manager? Do you like to manage and integrate and project manage? Are you actually the talent? The the biggest struggle for me, like I was sharing before we started, I'm the entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur for 25 years. Like love it. Being the yes. talent and being front stage, as I call it, was the hardest shift because then people want to manage you, yeah. right? When you show up, where you go. And I'm like, right. No one has touched my schedule for 25 years. <laughs> and now you're telling me where to yeah, go, right? Yeah. But everyone's different. Like you might be a really great doctor, a really great lawyer. Mm. Well, if you build a law firm or a doctor's practice, now all of a sudden you're going to be a business owner. You're yep. not going to be treating patients or working with clients the same way. And they don't realize that. And then what happens is it's like this inner civil war happens because you're trying to be something as opposed to being okay with who you really are, which might be the talent, which might be the manager. So you've got to build it with the right way or you're going to end up in a cage. You are so spot on. I have felt this like immensely because I'm the talent. Yeah. I love to write speeches and how am I going to teach someone sales and how am I going to get in there and how am I going to do my, like, I'm a creative and I, I love all that. And then, you know, what I fought with and what I continue to is like, okay, there's, there's this big business. Okay. That is not my strength. 
this is making me, you know, batshit crazy. (laughs) Like, you know, and so is your recommendation to hire a team then? There's only a few ways that you can grow a business, right? So when you have a business, there's, there's either growth and scale. Most people mess this up. When you're growing a business, you're investing in the business for, for exponential growth, right? You're trying to grow your top line revenue. When you're scaling a business, you're growing, but not at the same rate of your expenses. Mm -hmm. So meaning that you're growing, you might be growing locations, you might be investing in the team, but eventually instead of it going like this all the time, it needs to start to widen out and your growth needs to outgrow your expenses. That's when you truly start to hit scale. The only way, if you're a talent, again, this is people need to have these honest conversations because for some reason they think that one way is better than the other, but it's like, we can't all be entrepreneurs and we can't all be talent. And You're we certainly so can't right. all be managers. Yeah. But if you can have one of each people in that role and you hire them, that's when you can exponentially grow yeah. because you're leveraging other people's skill sets that are different mm. than your own. My whole goal starting a business, even at 19, was to hire people that were way better than me at yeah. providing services because they couldn't do what I do, which is market and build the business. Right. And I certainly couldn't do what they did, which yeah. is work one, one-on-one with clients all yeah. the time. That's what made us grow and really become like a mega in, in the area so great. because I really learned really easily and I didn't have pride to say, oh, I don't like to do that. Where a lot of people think they should be doing everything and they end up basically not being able to really do anything exceptionally well because they're majoring in all these little minor things all Girl, the time. Right? Oh my gosh. It sounds like we just need to get honest with ourselves. Oh my gosh. If people would just cut the crap yeah. <laughs> and like get to the real yeah. things, they would be have such a happier life. You're so spot on because I started a, a another new business and I was on a walk with my my partner in life and I was like, I kind of feel like a failure. And I was like I'm just not good at this minutia stuff. And I'm like, he's like, that's not who you are, Em. He's like, you're not wired that way. It's okay. We're going to find people that are, you know? And it's like, as an achiever, I was like, but I got to do this. I got to figure this out. I got to be good at this. Otherwise, I felt like I just sucked. Right, right, right. But the the thing is to remember is there's somebody else that isn't good at what what you do. And neither of those talents are better or worse. Right. But when you can put them together, it creates a superpower. Uh, I always say it's like just because you can, can you do the little things? Sure. But yeah. should you? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. Because it's not the best use of your time and your talents. Yeah. And I use the analogy is like it's kind of like we we take all these golf balls. We're trying to hold all these golf balls just to show that we could hold all these golf balls. And then we have our hands so full with all these golf balls. And God is trying to give us a big freaking basketball, but our hands are so full and we're holding on so tight. So really it becomes a point of what do you have to drop? What do you have to eliminate? What do you have to delegate so that you could expand and be able to grab the bigger thing that's coming? You know, one of the things I said that I think is just has been true for me. And I think for other people is to remember that sometimes we so desperately want something that we miss what we can have. And I think when we realize that by holding on to all of these things, it is blocking us from what we can have. It's like, then we, we realize that like, maybe these things aren't for us. Maybe they were to learn something about ourselves Mm -hmm. so that we can step into this next level more powerfully more capable, more intentional. So the question would be is what can you drop? What can you eliminate? Mm. What can you delegate so that you can really expand into your fullest self Mm. in this next chapter? So beautifully said. Oh my gosh. Have you struggled with that throughout your career being, you know, a powerful woman? Like, have you ever wanted control, you know, with like, I mean, I just think of like, I mean, you've been in business for 25 years. I feel like it's like, there's no way you're not even old enough, like, which is so awe-inspiring. Uh, but have you struggled with that at all? With like, like just letting go and trusting and having an abundant mindset and 
Yeah, not so much letting go and control because I've always known that the more I control, it's actually blocking me from growth. It's I need to have more people around me in order to grow and expand. Because even if you think about it, just with my arms, what did I do? Like yeah, when you're contract. holding, you're yeah. contracting. Yeah. And when I'm letting something go to you already, my hands Ugh. are in a completely different shape, right? Yeah. So it's like, what could we let go yes. in order to grow? So I haven't had that, although probably what I would say is I struggle with the most in that regard would be like, I trust that someone's going to do the job. And then I like, I'm letting go. And then when I find out that it's not being done, then I jump back in to try to fix Okay, where that's been always a struggle. Cause I, I really want to do things with excellence, mm -hmm. but I also know that 80% and done is better than hundred percent perfect. Yeah. So that's a balance excellence only being at 80%. That's always been a balance, but it's really about bringing the right people hiring the right people, being mm -hmm. around the right people, and knowing that even if they're not going to do it the best way, if you try to make sure that everything is the best, you'll never be able to grow. Yep. You have to be able to hire the right people, encourage them, and empower them to make their own decisions, to lead themselves. Mm -hmm. And then when they need you, you train them to come to you even only if they need something yeah. or they can't go past that whatever obstacle is, right. but not to come to you with all the minor things. Otherwise, you teach them to come to you for all the minor things Ooh. because you jump in and fix. So I think it's it's a very conscious decision when you're growing and leading yeah. teams to not jump back in and do that stuff. So good. What's a rich life to you? <sighs> Being able to create experiences, create memories, being able to give as much as you want, as often as you want to go wherever you want with whoever you want. Like that's, that's to be is, is the richness. You know, my dad, when I was writing this book, I was in Mexico and I got the call that no one ever wants to get. I got a call that my dad was life flighted. He was in a bad motorcycle accident and was life flighted an hour away to a trauma hospital. And I remember in that moment, obviously like being so panicked, trying to get on the next flight out, mm -hmm. you know, all the planes are down. I'm, I'm like calling friends. I'm like, does anyone have a jet here in Cabo or near that can come get me there? And being able to drop everything and go back to Pittsburgh, being with him for 10 days, not having to worry about my business, not having to worry about money and just to be there for him. Yeah. And to make sure he got the best care, to make sure that he had everything that he needed. Like to me, to be able to do that, where most people that would have crippled their life, yeah. like that's what building wealth's all about. It's for those moments when it really matters that everything's going to be okay, that you can take care of the people around you, that you can be with the people that mean a lot to you. And I think that we get so caught up into what it looks like yeah. as opposed to just how it feels. Oh. And I just wish people could feel it as opposed to worry so damn much about what it looks like. Yeah. And so that to me is, is really what it's about. It's creating a rich life and not looking rich. And I know people watch and they see this. Right. And it's like, we, we got to get through the fact that like, you can still have care about the way you look. You can still invest in the yes. way that you show up, but it doesn't mean that you're doing these things instead of investing That's right. or instead of being there for people That's or instead right. of contributing. That's when you know the difference. I didn't show up in the cars or have the Rolexes or have the things until I was already at a certain level. And yeah. I could have done it 10, 20 X what I currently do. I just chose not to because that's not what matters. And I think when we're building wealth, we don't realize it because we haven't felt it. So it yeah. becomes something that we want to attain. And I think other thing, the other thing too, is people are so focused on whatever the, maybe their experience was or their background or the family that they grow up in. They're so like focused on running from yeah. this experience or yeah. running from the yeah. relationship or running from the abuse yeah. and that they forget that at some point you get to pause and choose what you want to run towards. Yeah. And if you're constantly running from something and you're trying to build this life that looks a certain way, eventually you're going to get there and you're going to look back with a lot of regret. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the book and just sharing a lot of this that I've learned over 25 years is important because I, I don't want someone to wake up one day when they're 80 and look back and be like, I missed it. Mm. I missed it. Mm. Oh, my heart. You're so beautiful. I just have to tell you that oh, you. you're inside and out like a true inspiration. 
it's really refreshing to learn from you. And, and I'm so excited to have everyone read the book and, and to dive into your wisdom. Like, thank you for doing this. Truly, thank you for showing up the way you do. It's like, you can have it all. You can look, put together, have nice things, but build wealth, but also more importantly, live life with so much contribution. And you're doing it with your money. You're making your money matter, but you're also doing it by just teaching people like really what this is all about, which is so inspiring. You're being obedient. Thank you. And I'm proud of you. I think it's important for people to remember that a lot of what you just shared, and thank you for the for acknowledging that, a lot of what you just shared and a lot of what people, now that I'm a little more front stage, um, has said are a lot of those things. And yet they're the exact things that I tried to hide for so many years. You know, when I started back in the late 90s, there wasn't this like females supporting females. Like, no. it was like, who are you? Yeah. And no, 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 you need to do this. Like you can be a teacher or a nurse, like you're not going to build a business. Right. Like, so I think that a lot of those things we've learned to play small because we don't want to show up so fully. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to make someone feel a certain way about right. us. And so we try to people please and fit in. But I think it's really important to remember that when you are trading portions of yourself away mm -hmm. because you fear of what other people think of you, mm -hmm. that the only thing you're doing is you're not showing up for other people. Like I never realized that by me being more of me, by sharing more of what I know, by talking about the hard things, that it actually would provide hope yeah, for other people. For sure. Right? Yeah. I think we forget that. And I think it's important to remember because if anyone gets inspiration or, or strategy from this and they want to go after this next level for them, there will be people that come after you. Absolutely. There will be people that want to attack you because if they can't tear you down in one way, they'll right. try to tear down your right. integrity or say that yeah. you're doing it for another reason. I've heard it all. But at the end of the day, it's only because of two things. You're either triggering lack in them mm. and that rather than them go out and fix whatever it is in their life that they don't like because mm -hmm. they have the power to do that, they'd rather attack you for doing it because that's a lot easier. Right. Or the other thing is something in you is literally they want what you have. Like yep. they, they're jealous. Maybe your relationship, your confidence, yeah. just how you show up. And again, those are all things that they can control, but it's easier to go for that instant gratification mm. of attacking someone. But no one will gossip, judge, or criticize you that are going after big things themselves. Yes. They may disagree with the way you do things, and I think that's healthy. Yeah. But they won't attack you. Right. So use that as fuel not to cripple you. Right. Use that as fuel to show up. Because I can tell you that there's a lot of people that I maybe ruffled feathers around, along the way. Oh, I'm sure. That, oh, yeah. I've ruffled, uh, ruffled a lot of feathers. Yeah. But, you know, because, but have also come out later and was like, Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Like I'm reading your book. Thank you for showing up. I didn't understand you before. I really did now. And even if they don't ever, that's okay. That's okay. If it's in you to show up a certain way, do it because you mm. don't know what's going to come from it. Mm. And I just challenge people to have the strength to go through it anyways, mm. because the ripple effects that you'll create of goodness will be far more than you can ever measure. So well said. Oh my goodness. Ugh. Where can people find you? Candy Valentino everywhere, TikTok, Instagram, okay. um, candyvalentino.com. Wealth Habits is anywhere books are sold. Let's get the book. Let's tag Candy. Let's share what we learn from this episode. And I cannot wait to continue to follow you and learn from you. And I thank you, thank you, thank you for who you are and following the call that God has put on your life because you are playing such a big life and for all the right reasons. So I'm your I'm your fan. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. You for having me. Bye. So much. Bye, everyone.